Good day, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Petra Nakutney, and I'm Director of Operations of uh, Enhanced Oil Recovery and in situ Processes at Saskatchewan Research Council. Today, uh, over the next 20 minutes or so, I'll talk to you about enhanced oil recovery in unconventional light oil fields. So this is an outline of my presentation. I'll start with some of the um, main challenges uh, that uh, we are all familiar with in light and tight oil. Uh, then I'll talk about enhanced oil recovery options. Uh, and you can't really talk about EOR without uh, fracking uh, in, uh, in light and tight formations. Um, and uh, what's important to design a good frack is a uh, good understanding of geomechanics. And then I'll uh, have a few slides about uh, tools and techniques that we use at SRC to evaluate and help us uh, in designing these processes. Uh, so, title challenge, we're all familiar with it. It's uh, main, uh, the main biggest uh, issue is a quick decline. Um, at the same time, uh, the uh, tight oil is a major source of uh, oil production in North America. And uh, it, it's uh, really a driver of uh, self-sufficiency. Um, it's a, it produces light and sweet oil. Uh, which is great. And uh, again, if you could just address that the decline issue and uh, uh, sustain production a little bit longer, uh, that would mean we uh, could reduce potentially cost and uh, reduce the environmental impact from having to drill more wells and uh, do fracking and so on. So this, uh, this slide shows some of the main oil uh, title plays in Canada. Uh, we do share uh, back information with, uh, with North Dakota. Um, then there is also Viking, uh, Duvernay, uh, Montney, Cardium, and uh, a few other smaller formations. So it's, it's a significant resource, uh, especially in Saskatchewan. And uh, we've been working to um, uh, to, to find ways to uh, be a good steward of this resource. And uh, again, we would like to work with uh, uh, guys in, uh, in North Dakota, in, uh, in other states in, in the United States. Um, this is something they can learn from and work on together. Uh, so some of the other challenges, uh, other than the quick decline and then potentially what, uh, what we need to resolve in order for us to uh, solve this puzzle, uh, includes a reservoir fluid properties understanding. Uh, we still uh, have somewhat limited understanding of uh, how uh, reservoir fluid properties are different in the, in the very tight formation, tight, uh, tight pore space. Um, geomechanical properties, uh, again, this formation is quite variable and uh, heterogeneous, and we, uh, we still uh, learning how to characterize it uh, from geomechanical point of view, as well as uh, uh, geochemistry and uh, physical properties. Um, uh, it's uh, it's really, this is important because we want to be able to model this properly and we want to be able to upscale our experimental results in the lab uh, to the field without taking uh, too much risk. Uh, so one of the biggest issues for enhanced oil recovery is this uh, very complex fluid uh, flow geometry. Uh, in order for us to gain access to the reservoir, we, uh, we do fracking, so we frack the reservoir um, and that uh, also causes some smaller induced microfracts, and then there's also natural microfracts in the reservoir. So that means that now we have uh, formation permeabilities that varies from uh, really several nano Darcy to uh, several Darcy. Uh, it's it's okay when we do primary because we do want to have this uh, large surface area access to the uh, to the formation. But uh, in enhanced solar recovery, when we want to do flooding, this can cause issues. Um, so this is also very difficult to model in the lab. Uh, you cannot just use a regular core flood. Uh, you have to use either larger models or uh, really be creative in how you introduce the, um, uh, the fracture to uh, matrix flow in, in your laboratory experiments. Um, so there have been several studies, uh, and again, we, we have been doing this for quite some time, so we do understand a lot about fracking. But uh, what we are still trying to uh, learn more is uh, how this uh, fracks, uh, how is it working in enhanced oil recovery again, and how do we control it? How do we design a frack for enhanced oil recovery? Um, there is this uh, shattered rock volume concept 
So, um, you know, do we, uh, do we uh, have uh, a lot of micro frags that are connected to our main prop tracks or, um, or our formation is, is really more of, a, you know, big uh, uh, kind of two perm dual permeability system where you only have fracks and your matrix. And this is again important when you do flooding versus uh, cyclic process. In a cyclic process, you really want to have the shattered lock, rock volume uh, because that provides uh, a pathways for the fluid to go into formation and then diffuse and uh, potentially uh, interact with the oil and uh, get produced on the puff cycle. Uh, but uh, in a flooding, uh, this could all create uh, channels for oil, uh, for bypassing of whatever you inject in, be it water or gas. Um, so in a new world of data, uh, we, uh, we have to take and we can take advantage of uh, the wealth of data that's becoming available. Uh, we can do, and we have done some statistical studies uh, trying to understand the correlations and causation between the lengths of uh, wells, uh, lengths of fractures, distance between fractures, perforation lengths, uh, and various other parameters. Uh, we've done a study actually, uh, unfortunately, I can't share the results, but uh, we've been able to uh, learn a lot from uh, big uh, massive information that exists out there uh, in some of the public databases as well as uh, private. And uh, what you can do is you can correlate the different parameters and uh, try to understand what works better in a particular area. And that uh, allows you to uh, design better facts in the future. So now we'll talk a little bit about uh, enhanced oil recovery and uh, uh, how, uh, how it can be different from a conventional oil. Uh, so we, our understanding, and I've said this a few times, and even though we've been working on it for many years now, I would still say that our understanding of uh, EOR and tight reservoirs is quite limited. Um, we are starting from where we know, which is uh, what uh, humans do. Uh, we want to connect it to something that is familiar to us, which is uh, EOR in conventional oil. So that's why, uh, again, a lot of focus is on water flooding and gas flooding, and a lot of methodology that's used to study that uh, has been uh, borrowed uh, from conventional experience. And sometimes it works, but uh, sometimes it doesn't. And that's one of the reasons why we have many inconsistencies between the lab uh, simulation and field results. Uh, there are a few pilots out there uh, that's been uh, both in Canada and the United States in gas and water flooding. Some are somewhat successful, others are not. And uh, we are still not at a point where we could just use uh, our analogous fields and uh, you know, know what to do for particular formation. This is still a learning curve, which uh, creates an additional risk for uh, EOR. And uh, that makes it difficult to, uh, to commit uh, to invest uh, for, for oil producers, especially if the oil price in this uncertain as well. So what is a, a possible enhanced oil recovery uh, methods for uh, tight oil? Well, uh, gas flooding is uh, one of the, uh, you know, on somewhere in the top of the list because uh, gas has much lower viscosity and therefore injectivity is easier. Uh, also, uh, one of the gas, CO2, is, uh, is something that we want to be able to put away and uh, that we can um, reduce uh, general environmental impact of uh, our oil operation if we use CO2 uh, and store it in the ground. Um, flue gas is, uh, is uh, another, it's basically unrefined uh, flue gas uh, that can also be used uh, for enhanced oil recovery. Uh, produce gas, uh, and uh, in some cases, especially in high pressures, it can become miscible. Uh, and I'll talk about that in, in my subsequent slides. And then uh, natural gas is also something that can be used. Uh, basically, any any uh, gas uh, can be potentially used. Uh, at the very least, it will provide uh, pressure maintenance in the reservoir. Uh, then there's still also questions of uh, breakthrough bypassing and, and so on that need to be addressed. So water flooding is another uh, another uh, a group of uh, methods that could be used and uh, have been shown to work in uh, Canadian Bakken. And uh, this is something we are very familiar with in water flooding oil reservoirs uh, for 
more than 40 years. And uh, some, somewhat surprisingly, even in tight formations uh, like Canadian Bakken, it has been showing uh, decent results. Um, again, there you can uh, improve your water flooding by adding a uh, chemical uh, such as surfactant. And then thermal. Uh, so this is somewhat uh, of a black box uh, for now. We understand that thermal benefits heavy oil and uh, bitumen, but uh, you know why would you do thermal in the formation that already has a very low oil viscosity? Well, with thermal uh, energy, you can uh, further reduce viscosity, but you can also change the wettability uh, and uh, uh, some of the geomechanical properties. You can induce uh, some smaller microfractures, and uh, you can desorb, uh, basically improve your displacement efficiency, uh, especially if uh, your reservoir is uh, somewhat uh, intermediate or oil wet. So there are things that have um, been looked at, uh, such as uh, uh, hot water flooding or, and or uh, steam generation. And uh, a subset of that is uh, direct contact steam generation, where you inject both uh, steam and uh, flue gas into your formation. And each of these uh, processes you can do either in continuous mode or in a cyclic mode. So water flooding, uh, well, water flooding, like I said, it's uh, very familiar to us. Uh, we have access to water uh, typically, uh, at least uh, in, uh, in many areas in Canada. Um, also, there is a tendency to uh, for spontaneous imbibition, uh, especially in water at uh, formation. So water will imbibe naturally and uh, displace soil. Um, the issues out there are with uh, water compatibility, injectivity. Uh, so some uh, tight formations uh, such as Viking have a lot of clays and uh, there you have to be very careful not to damage permeability further. Uh, so we've developed a set of uh, injectivity tests. Even when the core is not available, we can do uh, use drill cuttings. And we, uh, it's important to do uh, geomechanic, uh, geochemical modeling, uh, which is also important for long-term storage of CO2. Uh, relative permeability, uh, it can be very difficult to study there as well because of uh, this uh, core is very tight. Uh, so you can use high-speed centrifuge for that. Uh, for microfractures, again, how do you design and frack your formation so that uh, you don't have a conduit from your injector to producer? And uh, for that, we, uh, we will look at both at modeling uh, in the lab, experimental modeling, larger scale, and uh, frack modeling, numerical frack modeling. And then water blocking. If you do a cyclic process of any kind, then um, you know once you get a high water saturation, then it the relative perm to oil drops uh, very significantly. And uh, basically this is what we call a valley of deaths of uh, relative perm uh, in the middle here, and uh, which makes it even more difficult for oil to flow. Uh, what, what you can do there, um, you can either uh, reduce interfacial tension or you can try to, uh, to shift away from a high water saturation zone. Uh, so chemical flooding is, is what can help you with uh, reducing interfacial tension. Uh, it's easy to implement. Uh, you just add in a little bit of uh, chemical. There is no capital requirement, but there are uh, quite significant operation costs sometimes. And uh, the chemical absorption uh, is a big issue uh, that uh, really, uh, if, if it could be resolved, uh, if, you, you know, if you can find a chemical that does not absorb in that particular reservoir, um, that will uh, be... Uh, that will have a lot of potential because capillary pressure is uh, governed by uh, poor radius. And of course, in tight formations, we have very high capillary pressure. Um, so once you uh, reduce uh, your artificial tension, your relative form curves become closer to uh, uh, diagonal straight lines, and therefore you lift the permeability at the bottom. And uh, which, yeah, which can improve your flow quite dramatically. So in order to study some of the um, availability, relative permeability, and just uh, oil water distribution, uh, we partnered with uh, Canadian uh, Synchrotron uh, that uh, exists in Saskatoon. And we did some very high resolution scans of, uh, of Bakken. Uh, there was a paper that we published on, on this. Uh, basically what we tried to look at uh, distribution of oil and water inside uh, inside Bakken core, and also how they changed with time. Uh, 
So there is uh, quite a bit of a difference between uh, aged or, or a natural bucking and uh, non-aged clean bucking. Um, so that we found this is to be, you know, this was a very good tool for us to better understand, uh, you know, the effect of uh, not only how we prepare the core, but uh, how, uh, how different uh, chemicals affect our operation. Um, so for gas flooding, uh, like I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we have better injectivity. Uh, we can have emissible or missable gas flooding, and I'll talk about that in a few slides uh, down the road. Um, so the question is, do we do continuous or cyclic? And again, uh, that's really depending on the, uh, uh, on the permeability and on the fractures that exist in your formation. So you have to use bigger models that incorporate fractures in order to study that. Uh, again, for induced and microfracts, uh, you need to understand uh, you know, what they are. And uh, there are different imaging techniques that can be used for that as well. And uh, when you're talking about uh, cy cyclic gas, uh, you really want to talk about uh, first contact miscibility rather than uh, multiple contact miscibility, which is more common concept. So we're talking about miscibility, uh, miscibility is, is basically something that uh, condition or uh, and it's a property uh, of a fluid that uh, if it's miscible, it can uh, mix with oil at uh, any proportion, uh, which means that there's no interfacial tension, uh, which then uh, means that theoretically you can clean out 100% of, of the oil. And uh, gases, uh, hydrocarbon gases and CO2 can achieve miscibility at certain pressure. Um, so propane uh, is, is, would be miscible with most of the, most of the oils and uh, assane and uh, CO2 can be miscible in Bakken, uh, but uh, methane is almost always immiscible. Um, so miscibility also depends on uh, oil properties a little bit, uh, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, for the light oil, it will depend on the pressure and, um, and the pressure, temperature, and the gas type. So some of the knowledge gaps that still exist with gas flooding is uh, once again to predict and characterize interfer interferences from fractures. How do we space and frack our wells such as they work well in primary, but also ready for EOR? Uh, what is the minimum injection amount that's needed? How do you optimize the rates? Uh, you know, if it's a, a cyclic process, what is the soaking time? And uh, once again, this shattered rock volume, how do we measure that? And uh, how do we uh, control, optimize it? So there are a few uh, projects in Canada that, uh, that are in public domain that we can talk about. Uh, there are water flood pilots in uh, Canadian Bakken uh, that performed by Crescent Point, uh, who's been doing water flooding for uh, over uh, 10 years now. And uh, there's also some natural gas, gas piloting and uh, a few other projects in uh, KPOP. And uh, some are on coins that are confidential. Uh, basically, what it, I wanted to say here is that uh, the, there is a significant potential. And as we run out of space to, to drill, uh, you know, as we are declining on some of the older wells, um, this is something that can definitely uh, revitalize or at least sustain the production from uh, tight formations. Uh, so just a few slides on frac design and geomechanic characterization, because again, you can't really talk about uh, anything, any kind of production from tight formation without talking about frac design. Um, so the challenge with the existing approach is that we really, the way we modeled it, it's, uh, it's very basic. We do not uh, differentiate between the different fractures. They're all uh, modeled to be the same size. We only know uh, one property usually or a few uh, data points along the well bore, uh, while properties of, uh, of the formation over like thousands of feet could vary significantly. Uh, fracture conductivity, the uh, current tests that are, exist that don't really take into account embedment of propent into the formation. And uh, fracts are really designed to maximize primary recovery and not UR. Um, so an approach that we would uh, recommend that SRC would uh, 
be a little bit more involved, but uh, would produce uh, better understanding and uh, better base for uh, designing and in our enhanced dollar recovery process. Um, so we, uh, we suggested uh, we do look at uh, coupled uh, flow uh, geomechanics and we incorporate as, as much data about the uh, reservoir as we can. Um, so this uh, shows a uh, workflow, uh, petrophysical modeling, uh, lab uh, core data. This is something standard. Uh, what we would suggest is uh, sand prop and embedment test and uh, Traxel uh, mechanics tests that are uh, more or less standard. Uh, again, it's important to incorporate all this data as much as possible into a uh, uh, modeling software and uh, then uh, the flow modeling uh, simulator. And at the end, you, you can uh, close the cycle and, and optimize, uh, test different scenarios. And uh, this is what will allow you to if not predict, but at least estimate the effect of enhanced soil recovery. Um, so some of the tests that uh, we've developed uh, include the uh, prop and embedment, uh, which is like a conductivity test, but uh, we, are, uh, look, we are using real rock and we also use in CT scanner that uh, allows us to see what's happening, not only to the prop and, but uh, to the formation itself. And uh, we can also look at the uh, micro level, uh, at the, uh, what happens to the prop and grains. Uh, prop and loading is a big question. Uh, there's a lot of money that go into prop and, and we can reduce the amount of prop and, uh, or say maybe for injectors, especially because they are gonna be overpressured. Uh, that would save a lot of money. And uh, so this is something we can do on the discrete element uh, modeling and uh, uh, using the results from the lab. So uh, in order to create a good frac model, you need to understand the properties of the reservoir along the well bore. Um, and again, you can only take so much core and it's expensive. So what we've been trying to do is uh, to take drill cut data and then uh, uh, only one or two core plugs uh, and then try to um, compare the uh, properties, uh, ge geomechanical properties, geochemical properties uh, that we can obtain from drill cut data to the actual plugs. And um, we can do that by characterizing drill cuts, uh, but also using CT scanner and uh, looking at the distribution of uh, uh, mineralogy in, inside a core plaque and in, in, inside our drill cuts. So then you can do uh, mapping and uh, which uh, then you basically extrapolate uh, the properties and you get uh, many data points along the well bore and you can use uh, machine learning segmentation. Uh, you can study this in several different ways. So uh, finally, uh, just an overview of uh, the experience that we have at SRC and uh, various tools and techniques, uh, in addition to what I've talked about that we use. Um, so we, we conduct uh, many standard uh, experiments such as uh, conventional and special core analysis, uh, slim tube and rising bubble apparatus visibility and so on. But uh, what we really would like to emphasize is that for uh, unconventional formations, we really need to have unconventional approach. And uh, so some of, the, uh, some of the additional tests that we've developed are uh, small scale diffusion and visibility experiments, uh, first contact visibility, which is not new, but it's not done uh, often. Uh, large core uh, physical modeling, which I'll talk about in the next slide. Uh, I've mentioned prop and abatement testing and uh, imaging tool and um, imaging and modeling tool. Uh, once again, the overriding theme is that uh, having representation of fractures in, in your modeling, be it in the lab or numerically is uh, very important. So this is one of the large scale experiments uh, that, that we've uh, developed and it allows us to have this uh, matrix to fracture flow inside our model. Uh, we can use synthetic core when real core is not available, or we can of course use real core when it is available. And what it allows us is to uh, look at the performance of a uh, water or gas flooding or another process uh, on a more realistic uh, scale. 
and uh, we make sure that we incorporate the mechanisms that are going to be critical in the field. So this not only allows us to study what we know, but basically to predict what we don't know and uh, remove some of the risks that we'd otherwise face uh, going blindly into the field. The small scale experiments, half and puff, that's really, um, that's, this is not new, but I just uh, wanted to reemphasize the importance of it, especially in uh, cyclic half and puff processes. It allows you to look at the diffusion of uh, various uh, agents, uh, such as miscible gas, into the formation and oil production. And coreless injectivity evaluation, uh, when real core is not available, uh, we can take drill cut-ins and uh, not only study the uh, mineralogy, but uh, use them to make some small core plugs and uh, do injectivity tests and potentially other types of experiments as well. So this is uh, what would give you a much quicker and lower cost method for evaluating injectivity. Um, again, the overriding theme here is uh, really targeted approach. Uh, we need to understand what we're trying to achieve. Uh, we're definitely uh, not advocating for spending years in the lab, uh, but uh, rather than uh, using conventional uh, tools and methods, what's important is to really understand, again, uh, what, we need to, uh, uh, what we need to measure here and uh, what is the optimal uh, approach that would not only uh, you know, be cheap, but uh, provide us the maximum possible information. So that concludes my presentation and uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'll be happy to discuss any of the, any of these points or anything else that uh, might be of importance to you. Uh, we would like to understand the issues that you're facing. Uh, do not hesitate to give us a call or uh, send me an email. Um, again, uh, looking forward to, uh, to talking to you and uh, hope you enjoyed this presentation and uh, other presentations at the conference. Thank you.